Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today in our lecture for Toronto National uh, Field, sorry, uh, I'm going to start it again because I'm nervous. It's my first time, so okay. Uh, the Toronto Field Naturist. Uh, we are welcoming Jessica Linton. Jessica is a senior biologist at Natural Resource Solution Inc. in Waterloo. Her consulting project work is varied and involves a number of taxonomic groups, but one of her areas of expertise is butterflies. She is a member of the Committee of the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada and the chair of the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk, Recovery and Implementation. We are pleased to have her with the Toronto Field Naturalist today. And thank you, Jessica, for being part of our lecture series. Today, she will give us an overview of her research and ongoing work, which includes the spearheading Ontario's first reintroduction project for mottled dusky wings at Pinery Provincial Park. In addition to other current provincial and national effort to protect and restore Ontario's butterfly species at risk. Butterfly is what she really is into it, looks like. And uh, please don't forget, right after a presentation, we will have a Q&A period. So please stay with us. And uh, for now, I will turn the floor to Jessica. Great, thank you. Thanks for that introduction and for having me today. Um, I'll just share my screen and get my presentation going here. We should start it at the beginning, I suppose. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Someone give me a thumbs up. Yes, we can. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so today, um, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking to, about the butterfly species at risk uh, work we've been doing. And a large emphasis on that has been on model dusky wing, which is the, the butterfly that's pictured on the first slide. Um, this is a species that I have been working on probably for about 15 years now um, through various different projects that I've worked on. Um, and so, but it ties into a larger story, I think about species at risk and um, the rare habitats that some of these species occupy. So I'm just gonna talk about that today and, and the work that we're doing and, and hopefully uh, you learn something and enjoy the presentation. So, You'll hear the term species at risk a lot in my presentation, um, but what are species at risk? Often we associate them with large kind of charismatic uh, species such as polar bears, orca whales, caribou. These are the ones we often see in the media. We see um, advertised when things are talking about extinction rates. Um, but there are many species at risk throughout the world, many in Canada as well, that are of the smaller variety. And those are the ones that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I primarily work on insects and, and even more so specialize in butterflies. Um, when I refer to something as a species at risk, it basically is defined as a, a wildlife or plant species that is at some risk in the future of becoming extinct or extirpated from Canada. So if a species is endangered, that is the highest level of categorization. Um, for being at risk. And that means that the species is in imminent risk of um, becoming extirpated or extinct unless something is done to reverse the threat to that species. A species that is threatened um, is at imminent risk of becoming endangered. And then the lowest ranking is special concern. And that, that ranking is given to species that aren't necessarily in critical um, trouble yet, but they're ones that we have our eye on because they are of concern and they do have some um, threat that they're facing or some notable um, thing happening with their population declining that, that signals that something might be wrong. And then there is one last category of being at risk in Canada uh, and that is extirpated. So that means that the species no longer occurs in Canada but does occur elsewhere in the wild in the world. So in Canada, uh, we have an assessment process that typically runs on a 10 year assessment um, cycle. So first a wildlife species is um, assessed. Usually that happens first at the federal level, but not always um, by this, the committee that um, 
was mentioned that I sit on, which is the Committee of the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And the acronym for that that you might hear is CASIWIC. So first an assessment takes place and it's decided whether that species should, should be afforded protection under our federal or provincial uh, legislation that protects species at risk. If it is decided that a species is endangered or threatened, it receives protection under those legal acts. Um, once a species is listed as endangered or threatened under uh, the Species at Risk Act federally, or in Ontario, the Endangered Species Act, that basically triggers a process in which the government is responsible for developing a recovery plan for that species. And a recovery plan is essentially just a planning document that outlines the steps that should be taken in order, in order to reverse the trend of what's threatening that species. And then of course, after the plan is done, then the next step would be implementing that plan. And then after implementing, usually that's an ongoing and long process, there is involved in that monitoring evaluation to determine the effectiveness of implementing that plan. And then the species often comes up for reassessment again. And as I mentioned, that's usually a 10 year cycle. And so the idea is that when, after you get to 10 years after a status listing, um, that there's been some headway made in terms of um, reversing the trends that made that species a species at risk to begin with. So today, as uh, was mentioned, I'm going to talk about butterflies. So what butterflies are at risk in Ontario? Well, we have um, a, a fairly significantly diverse array of butterflies in Ontario. We have more diversity in Ontario than any of the other provinces. Um, and specifically, uh, southern Ontario has a high diversity of species, the highest in all of um, Canada, next to probably the Okanagan. Um, and of course, because we're situated so far south. Many of the species that we have here in Ontario are the southern, ex or sorry, the northern extent of their range. Um, and then we also get several migratory species as well. As well. So I'm just going to run through the species at risk that we do have here in Ontario. Um, two that I just recently added to my presentation are to watch for. These are the northern oak hair streak, which are pictured on the right hand side, and duke skipper, which are pictured on the left. And these were just in 2022 assessed by Kasiewicz. Um, and the hair streak on the right was listed as threatened and the duke skipper on the left was listed as special concern. So those are recommendations now that have been put forward by the Committee of the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada to the minister. And it will be up to the minister to make the final decision on those the listings of those species. Um, but now that a federal assessment has been done, likely a provincial one will, will follow. Um, both of these species are um, endemic to Ontario in terms of their Canadian range. So I don't see any reason why they won't be listed um, in, the, in the coming future in the province. Um, so in Canada, or sorry, in Ontario, we actually have six butterfly species at risk. And this is one that's probably familiar to many of you, especially if you're in Toronto or you frequent High Park, it's the Carner Blue Butterfly. Unfortunately, it has a provincial status of extirpated, meaning it no longer occurs in Canada anymore. Um, it did occur in several localities throughout Southern Ontario, which I'll show on a map in a moment. Uh, one of them being High Park down in Toronto. The second butterfly species at risk is the frosted elephant, also listed as provincially extirpated. It was only known from one location um, down in, in Norfolk County at the St. Williams Forest, uh, Forestry Reserve. Um, and it also no longer occurs. It hasn't been seen since 1988. The third butterfly is the Eastern Perseus dusky wing, um, a small dusky wing species. It was associated with frosted elephant and carnivore blue, um, and it's also considered, considered extirpated. So this is a range map depicting where these three species um, traditionally were known from in Ontario. The black triangles represent carnivore blue known locations. The red circles represent Eastern Perseus dusky wing locations. And then the green square is the frosted elephant that was just from that one location down in Norfolk County. These are um, all records from the 1900s. Um, they were all kind of later or mid 1900s. It's likely that these species were much more far reaching and widespread in Southern Ontario before European settlement. They are all associated with what we call oak savanna habitats, which I'll talk about a little bit more in this presentation. 
These are rare habitats now in Southern Ontario. Um, and all three of these species essentially are thought to have been lost in Canada because of habitat loss and destruction. So in uh, 2017, I completed the federal recovery strategy for these three species. The reason that we did a joint um, recovery strategy for all three species is because they all occurred in similar habitats. Their ranges uh, overlapped wherever they did co-occur. Um, and uh, thirdly, they all feed on wild lupin as larvae. So they all have what we call the same butterfly host plant. Um, so very similar threats, uh, likely similar um, issues that cause all three of their extirpation. So that document is a federal recovery strategy that outlines what needs to be done to reverse um, the extirpation of these species. Number four is probably uh, our most famous butterfly, uh, monarch butterfly. It has a provincial and federal status of special concern currently. So it is one of the um, species that I, I mentioned that isn't legally protected by any uh, legislation right now. You may have heard in the news about how Kasiwik did put forward a recommendation several years ago that it be uplisted to endangered. Um, there's also been petitions in the United States to uplist the species due to um, alarming declines in its population, which we measure based on their overwintering grounds in Mexico. Um, but to date, the minister has not made a decision on listing this species. Number five is the West Virginia white. So this is the only species that isn't considered an open country or open habitat specialist butterfly. All the other species we've talked about so far occur in, um, as I mentioned, oak savannas or with monarchs, they're more generalist, but still they occur in open habitats, meadows, roadsides, um, parks, that sort of thing. West Virginia white is kind of unique because it actually occurs mainly associated with woodlands and woodland edges. Um, its host plant, the plant that it feeds on as a larva is um, toothwort, which is something that actually likes to grow in shaded woodland areas. So this too is a species of special concern. Um, previously, it was listed and protected under uh, federal legislation, but new populations of it were actually discovered, which warranted um, actually uh, decreasing its, its status in Ontario. And then lastly, um, the model dusky wing. So the model dusky wing is our only species that we have in Ontario that's listed as endangered. Um, it's protected by both the federal, or sorry, that's a mistake. It's not protected by our federal legislation. It's another species similar to the monarch where the minister has not made a decision. But uh, notwithstanding that, it is actually protected by our Provincial Endangered Species Act. So that affords protection to both individual butterflies as well as their habitat in Ontario. So this is the species that the rest of my presentation will largely focus on today, a species I've been working on for some time. So the model dusky wing is, as you can see, a kind of a, a more drab, not so flashy butterfly. So it hasn't received as much attention as some other species you hear about, like Turner Blue and the Monarch. But um, as I noted, it is our only endangered species. So it's worth um, uh, my time, I think, to be working on it particularly because it, it occupied a lot of the same habitats that all of those extirpated lupin feeders occupied. So that means that this species is kind of hanging on. And if we don't do something to reverse the threats that it's facing, it too will disappear. Um, like all butterflies, it has a four stage life cycle consisting of eggs, which females lay on their larval host plants. In Ontario, larval host plants are um, in the genus Ceanothus. So that includes New Jersey tea, which is pictured on the right hand side there. And also a very closely related species called narrow leaf New Jersey tea or um, prairie red root. Um, and then of course the eggs hatch into larvae which feed on those host plants. Um, the larvae pupate and form chrysalis and then act, uh, hatch out as adult butterflies. So in Ontario, this entire life cycle takes place mainly around um, its host plant. They have a very small geographic uh, range when for individuals and populations. Um, the eggs are laid, as I mentioned, directly on the plants. The caterpillars or larvae feed on plants and they often um, create leaf shelters using silk, as you can see picture on the right hand side there. So they're like little silken enclosures that they hide in often during the day and then they feed on the plants at night. 
and that helps protect them. Um, in most areas of Ontario, they have one flight season and they fly from mid-May or late May through June, sometimes into the first week of July. And then um, those butterflies that have hatched out in the spring, they die off, their larvae continue to eat for a portion of the summer. Then when they're done um, growing, they actually enter a state of hibernation that we call diapause, where they are basically inactive, their metabolic rate slows down, and they remain in that little leaf shelter there that eventually falls to the ground when the leaves fall in the fall or autumn time. And that's where they remain for the entire winter as this diapausing larva over the winter. And then in early spring, when the ground starts to warm up, they'll pupate um, until they emerge as an adult butterfly. So um, everywhere that we have extant populations, except for the introduced population I'm gonna talk about later today, we just have one generation of butterfly a year and um, it, this one life cycle that takes one entire year. So this is the um, current and historical distribution of model duskewing in Ontario. Um, the yellow circles, which are most prominent are the extant locations. So locations where they are still um, uh, alive in the wild. And then the green and the blue triangles are all the locations that they have been lost from. And the, the color just depends on the date. So the green ones have been lost more recently um, and the blue ones are historical locations that we mainly know about from uh, insect collections where um, those specimens were collected at particular locations. But if you recall the map that I showed of where the other lupin feeding butterflies were, you can see there's some overlap. Um, there were populations in Norfolk County down by Long Point, populations over in Grand Bend near the Pinery, uh, populations down near Toronto and High Park. Um, so occupying a lot of those similar habitats as Kerner Blue. Um, you can see off to the far right of the map, there are some green triangles up there. There used to be some well-known populations in Ottawa area, and they disappeared as recently as 2007. So this is the recovery strategy for the model dusky wing. Um, it's a provincial recovery strategy, which I completed in 2015. And similar to the federal strategy of the, of the lupin feeding butterflies I talked about, it's essentially just a, a planning tool. So it lays out um, some information about the species biology, it identifies what threatens the species in Ontario, and then it lays out um, a roadmap essentially for things that need to happen in order to protect and recover that spe the species. And it includes things like habitat restoration and creation. Um, it includes a, a large research component because there is a, a lot of things that we still don't know about this species. Um, and it also includes um, a, a program to reintroduce it to formerly occupied locations. Many of these species that I've talked about today, uh, with the exception of the monarch, which um, most of you probably know is migratory and can fly very far, most of these butterfly species live out their entire life in really small areas. They don't have the ability to fly very far. So even if we were to say, um, create a large area of habitat for it, it's not um, likely that it's going to find its way to that habitat on its own. So we need to work to, to do translocations and assisted migration. So before we get into recovery though, it's important to talk about what's going on that created this problem where we have these butterfly species at risk. Why are these butterflies um, disappearing from our landscape? Well, I mentioned earlier oak savanna communities. Um, if you're familiar with oak, uh, High Park, which probably many people in this group are, but many people don't um, have any familiarity with oak savanna communities. In terms of definition, they're communities that have about 25 to 35% tree canopy closure. So they're relatively open. In Ontario, um, the trees that are associated with them are primarily black oak. They have understory plants consisting of tall grass, what we call indicator species. So indicators of like prairie or tall grass habitat include things like big blue stem grass, yellow pimpernel, wild bergamot, woodland sunflower, smooth leaf aster, and wild lupin. Um, these habitats are also adapted to fire, which you'll hear me talk about uh, uh, quite a bit today. And fire is important because it helps maintain an open or semi-open canopy. 
that creates this oak savanna system. And so fire suppression is considered a really high threat to these communities. So for those of you who aren't familiar just visually with what an oak savanna looks like, um, you can see that there are large scattered uh, oak trees forming a little bit of can canopy, but not a lot. And then there's a tall grass um, prairie underneath. So that's kind of characteristic of what an oak savanna looks like, even with fewer trees, I would say in many instances. So in terms of oak savanna in Ontario, it's estimated that at one time, more than 11 million hectares of North America were actually covered with dry, sandy oak savanna and woodland and prairie. Um, at least 800 kilometers squared and perhaps as much as 2000 kilometers squared of tall grass, prairie and oak savanna vegetation existed in Ontario before European settlement. The land was then converted to agriculture and housing developments following um, European settlement. And the other thing that's really noteworthy to note here is that traditionally we think these open and semi-open habitats were largely maintained in some instances by wildfire, but more so by uh, First Nations groups, uh, communities who um, use fire as a tool in, in their cultural practices, but they also use it to prepare land for um, planting medicinal plants, um, for planting food plants, as well as for hunting. So these systems are really maintained by burning areas, burning off the woody vegetation, which allowed the oak savanna and prairies to persist. So today, you know, following the, the large scale, widespread and large scale loss of these communities, they continue to be threatened, um, both by habitat loss and fragmentation. So we're left with kind of little disjunct pockets of these habitats throughout Southern Ontario. And so they're more susceptible to, I would say even more susceptible to additional threats, which include improper habitat management. So with, in the absence of First Nations communities burning the land, um, there was a large amount of fire suppression and that's being introduced somewhat back into the landscape through prescribed fire uh, and conservation efforts. But fire suppression is still a, a, a large concern for these types of habitats. Invasive species, um, climate change, of course, is threatening all of our ecosystems uh, and, and pesticide use. On the bottom right hand side there, you can see uh, aerial spraying. So um, many of you may be familiar with spongy moss. Um, we've had a, some large outbreaks in the last few years. Spongy moss uh, really prefer to feed on, although they will, will feed on a variety of trees, they really like oak trees. So they can be particularly damaging to oak woodlands and oak savannas. And of course, where you get spongy moss is where people would like to be spraying for spongy moss. And so that's a huge threat to butterfly species at risk because the pesticide that they use to control spongy moss are not specific to that species. They're a, what we call a non-target lepidopteran pesticide, meaning any butterfly or moss species in caterpillar form at the time that that pesticide is applied um, will be uh, killed by it. So there's all the threats, so those are all the bad news. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the good news. What's being done to protect and recover butterfly species at risk? Um, well, in 2017, the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk um, Recovery Team was formed. This is a group comprised of a variety of organizations and individuals with different um, areas of expertise and different stakeholder interests. It includes um, members from academia from three different universities. We also have representatives from non-government organizations, the provincial and federal government. Um, you can see some of you may know Karen and Bob Yukic from uh, High Park Nature. Um, we also have uh, representatives from Wildlife Preservation Canada, the Toronto Zoo, uh, the company that I work for, Natural Resource Solutions, so I chair the team. Um, so it's a wide variety of groups and uh, we all work collaboratively on this team. You can see here, these are um, just to give you an idea of the, the different variety of organizations that make up this team. So it's truly uh, multidisciplinary. So the overall mandate of the recovery team is to promote the conservation and recovery 
of Ontario's butterfly species at risk in their habitats. And when we came up with this mandate, we tried to be as general as possible because we really wanted to leave some flexibility in terms of the work that we do, um, what maybe we might be able to focus on and raise funds for. Um, and, and, and in turn, we didn't want to list any particular species at that time because there's no guarantee, of course, that new species won't come online. So this gave us a bit of flexibility. But we did decide to outline some short-term um, goals as well because recognizing that you know this overreaching mandate is quite broad. So in terms of our short-term goals, um, we decided to support activities that promote existing populations of model dusky wings and their habitats. And the reason we decided to focus on model dusky wing, as I mentioned, is it's Ontario's only endangered species. So whereas our other really critically at risk species have now been extirpated, they no longer occur here. There's not much at this moment in time we can do about that specific problem. So why not turn our attention and focus on a species that we still have that really needs our attention. Um, with that, um, we decided that completing and supporting activities which result in the reestablishment of model duskwing at formerly occupied sites should be a high priority. And to conduct research that fills in knowledge gaps, not only identified in the model dusky wing recovery documents, but also ones for other species at risk, such as Carner blue, frosted elephant, and eastern Perseus dusky wing, because there is um, research is probably the number one thing that we need um, in the beginning to support recovery of any of these species. Support creation and enhancement of butterfly species at risk habitat, and particularly oak savanna habitat in Ontario. Provide support to land managers in order to do this and to conduct and support public outreach and stewardship activities to get the word out about these efforts um, and, and, and get public support for them. So a number of years ago, a number of the recovery team um, representatives decided to apply for an NSERC Alliance grant. And this is a National Research Council grant. It requires an academic lead. And so Dr. Ryan Norris at the University of Guelph um, offered to be the principal investigator and lead this grant. Um, and the reason we decided to go for an NSERC grant was because up until this point in time, which was about, um, let's see, 2020, 2020, we were essentially just applying for funding for individual projects or activities that needed to be done. Most of them were only one to two years and, you know, relatively small pots of money. And really to, to think about tackling a recovery program for a species at risk, you need some guarantee of long-term funding and you need quite a bit of money to do it. So that's why we decided to go for an Alliance grant. So the Alliance grant is a partnership mainly between the University of Guelph and the Nature Conservancy of Canada, but also a number of other recovery team members um, that all bring something different to the table in terms of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today. So, Overall, you know, we have a lot of goals for this NSERC Alliance and a lot of projects on the go, which I'll, I'll talk about. But the main things that come out of this is that this funding has allowed us to get a PhD student, up to five master's students. And this has 12 plus summer students, but we actually hired 18 summer students this year to work on this project, which was outstanding. And so it's really allowed us to get the people and the level of effort needed engaged. It's also allowed us to train a huge, huge like army of conservation professionals that are up and coming um, with regards to the research that we're doing. So you'll recall this map where I showed you the both the current and historical range of model duskewing in Ontario. Well, we set out with the goal firstly to reintroduce model duskewing to Pinery Provincial Park. Um, and so I'll talk about a bit about that. We also have a goal in the NSERC Alliance to reintroduce model dusky wing to the Norfolk area, the St. Williams Conservation Reserve and surrounding lands. And then we've also identified that this work, even if we don't get to it in this grant, which is five years, uh, we do hope to do some either augmentation or reintroduction into some of the other locations where it currently occurs to bolster populations as well. So what are the current projects that we're working on? Um, well, a large portion of the work, particularly that Nature Conservancy of Canada is doing, um, as well as Conservation Halton, Ontario Parks, and the Alderville Black Oak Savanna is working on habitat restoration. Some of these activities were already ongoing uh, when the recovery team formed and we got this NSERC, and um, some of it is, is new as well. 
And basically the idea is that we need to be creating more oak savanna habitat um, and we need to be managing it properly through um, control of woody species that outcompete the important understory species like wild lupin you can see in the photo on the left there, um, as well as reintroducing fire onto the landscape. Um, so this is a, a large component of many of the, the members of the recovery team and the work that they're doing. Um, one of the main components of the, of the NSERC Alliance grant is a large mark reciting study focused on model duskewing. And so this project doesn't just occur at one location, it occurs at multiple locations. So currently the program involves um, marking and reciting butterflies in order to get population estimates, information on their survival and their dispersal at um, multiple locations in the Rice Lake Plains on existing populations. And we of course wanna study those populations because they've been able to persist. And so we would like to get information from them on you know, things like what is the minimum viable population size required for a population of model dusky wing to be self-sustaining. We also, until we started this project, had no idea how far they could fly, um, what the typical home range of an individual would be, how long individuals lived as butterflies. We had zero information on that. So this, this project has been really important in opening up those doors and helping us answer some of those questions. Um, you can see on the bottom right hand side there that we mark the butterflies with um, a number of colored markings. And we do that by carefully removing the scales or that powdery stuff that's on their wings and exposing their, um, their, their wing underneath and then painting it with a small drop of nail polish. And by painting them individually with individual marked colors, we can actually identify individuals. So one day um, the team will go out and mark all the butterflies they see using a systematic sampling protocol. And then the next day they go out and they walk the area to see how many they can recite. And they alternate marking and reciting throughout the entire flight period for the butterfly. And that has allowed us to get amazing data on this species. So 2022, I believe is our fourth year of mark reciting studies. Um, Dr. Nusha Kegelbody at Western University um, also was working on conservation genetics. This was one of her master's students that just graduated this year, Shayla, and she was able to collect uh, genetic samples from all of the existing Ontario populations that we have, as well as an extant population in southeastern Manitoba and several populations in the United States. So that allowed her to actually develop the genetic markers for these species and um, for us to also get information on individual populations. So when we're thinking about things like reintroducing a butterfly to an, a formerly occupied location, we not only need to know uh, what the population size is for the population we're thinking of taking from, but also what the genetic diversity is. Um, of course, some, a population with low genetic diversity is not ideal uh, for building a new population. So that was what Sheila worked on over the two years of her master's project. and. Um, it was really, really insightful and interesting, and we got a lot of information that uh, just didn't exist for this species anywhere in the world. Thirdly, um, we've been working on a captive rearing project, and this is uh, spearheaded by the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory um, in Cambridge. They started in 2018, um, working on this project, not with model dusky wing, but with a surrogate species, a really common dusky wing that's closely related to the model dusky wing um, called the uh, wild indigo dusky wing. And so we use that species basically to do a bit of experimenting, to figure out how much food they were gonna eat, what type of enclosures were gonna work best, what temperatures, humidity levels, light levels, all of these things that we wanted to figure out in order to have a successful captive rearing program, but we didn't necessarily wanna play around with an endangered species. So 2018, um, they worked out all these kinks with this more common species. And then 2009, or sorry, 19 and 2020, we actually brought model dusky wing into captivity. Um, it was very successful, more successful than we had hoped. Um, females would readily lay eggs in captivity. Uh, we had a very high survival rate of both eggs and larva. Um, so that was really promising. And then at that point in time, we weren't ready to actually do any reintroductions yet. So we just let them go at the source population where we got them. So we did that for two years. 
And then in 2021, our captive rearing program uh, was used to actually generate butterflies planned for reintroduction. So um, the first reintroduction project that we've been working on is at Pinery Provincial Park in southwestern Ontario. It's on the shore of Lake Huron. Um, for those of you who haven't been there, I suggest you go. It's a stunning park, um, primarily comprised of oak woodland, but large areas of oak savanna as well. Um, and in 2021, we released 692 butterflies at um, Pinery Provincial Park. And the reason that we chose Pinery as the first reintroduction location was one, because it was a formerly occupied location. We knew model dusky wing had occurred there previously, but also because although it was lost previously due to habitat degradation, over the last 20 years, the park has made amazing strides in terms of um, reestablishing the former habitats that were there. They were really suffering in the 80s from overbrowsing by an out of control deer population. Um, there was no disturbance or fire happening in the park, so the canopy had really closed things in. And there had been a lot of um, pushing for tree planting back in the 80s, uh, which and, and before that as well, which resulted in a lot of canopy cover that necessarily wouldn't have been there previously. So we felt like the habitat was there. Um, the New Jersey tea, the plant that these butterflies rely on, had been almost entirely removed from the park by um, canopy shading and deer browsing, deer love New Jersey tea. And once they started managing the habitat, opening the canopy up without any assistance, the New Jersey tea was in the seed bank and it just flourished again. And now it's one of the most common understory plants I would say in the park. So that's the reason that we chose Pinery. So um, in 2021, as I mentioned, we released 692 butterflies. This represented the first ever reintroduction of a butterfly species in Ontario. Um, and because we had been so successful with our captive rearing program in Cambridge, we actually had the luxury, I would say luxury is a good word to use, of being able to experiment a little bit with what um, life stage we released. So if you look in the literature, on uh, butterfly reintroduction programs that have happened in other places around the world. There isn't like a set recipe that says, you know, releasing adult butterflies is best or releasing caterpillars is best or releasing pupa is best. For different species, they have different um, responses to those different treatments. So what we decided to do was pick out different kind of geographically isolated locations in the park and introduce larva at one, pupa at another and adults at another. And that would allow us to see what the best life stage uh, is for release for this species. One of the most exciting things we had in 2021 was confirmed oviposition or egg laying by females. And we also noted that the females were sticking around the areas where we had let them go. So that was really good. It indicated that one, they were happy with the habitat we selected for them and two, that they felt comfortable enough to mate and lay eggs. So those are two really key things for a successful reintroduction. Um, throughout the 2021 monitoring season, uh, we started a mark reciting study. So similar, the exact same kind of program that we were doing at the Exton sites where we marked and recited butterflies for the entire flight period. Um, we also were monitoring the survival of the different life stages we had released. So you can see kind of on the bottom left-hand corner there, we had little PCV tubes where we put in the pupa on sticks. So that allowed us to check them every day and we could see whether they successfully hatched, um, whether they'd been predated um, or whether they just failed to hatch. So we had a really accurate count of how many pupa were hatching. The mark resetting allowed us to monitor the butterflies. And then we did attempt to mark, uh, to track the larva, which is what this um, researcher is doing on the right-hand side here with the green flags, but they proved very difficult to track. They're small, they're green, um, and they're very hard to find. So larva monitoring did not go as well as we had hoped. <laughs> so um, the other thing that was really exciting and really interesting about Pinery is that we observed two generations of adult butterflies. So as I mentioned, Earlier, everywhere that we have egg scent populations still in Ontario, they have one generation a year of butterflies that fly from late May to early July at the latest. Historically, the records indicate from specimen collection that in southwestern Ontario, so down in Pinery, St. Williams, down towards Windsor, where those populations occurred, there was actually two 
generations of butterflies throughout the summer. So a second generation of butterflies flew from late in July through August. Um, and we actually saw that butterflies, when re reintroduced to pinery, reverted to that second generation. And we had a second generation of butterflies flying, which was pretty cool. So in 2022, um, we confirmed that at least some butterflies successfully overwintered. So essentially we spent the whole winter just waiting with bated breath to see if what we had done had been successful. And uh, we did confirm early in the season that adult butterflies were flying around. Um, again, throughout the season, we saw first and second generation butterflies. We also confirmed again that butterflies were laying eggs. You can see that they were mating in the field. Um, we also did an additional release of butterflies from the conservatory. And that was always something that we planned. Um, most reintroductions take several years of pumping butterflies into a population in order for it to build enough individuals to be self-sustaining. And we also decided to modify treatments because what we saw was that in the different areas where we did different treatment releases, that not all of them appeared to be working as well. So. Uh, most notably, where we reintroduced larva in 2021, we saw very few butterflies in 2022. And so um, if you remember, though, I noted that we did this at different sites. So we weren't 100% sure whether it was the site that was the issue that they didn't like, or it was the fact that we released larva. So what we did this year was we switched things up. So we actually reintroduced larva at a different site that we hadn't done any introductions at yet so that we can check its success in 2023. And then at the site where we introduced larvae, where we saw very few butterflies, we introduced um, adult butterflies, which seemed to be in 2021 a successful way of reintroducing them. So the plan, this was always part of the plan. We plan to do the treatments for two years because one year of data doesn't really give you good data. You know, you still have to make guesses about what's working. But after two years, we think we should have some fairly solid evidence about what life stage we should be reintroducing. And then from then on out, we'll likely only be reintroducing one life stage. At this point in time, it looks like it might be pupa, um, which is good. Pupa are easy to transport and they're also easy to monitor in the field to see if they hatch. Excuse me. So on top of the, um, the actual research that we're doing at Pinery, we're also trying to do a ton of stewardship and outreach. So of course I do talks like this to interested people, field naturalist groups. Um, I've also gone and give uh, university lectures. Um, I've, I've occurred at conferences. So just trying to get the word out as much as possible. We're also in the process of wrapping up a three-year documentary with Pine Grove Productions. So we were able to secure some funding uh, which allowed Pine Grove to follow us throughout the last three years of this project, um, from the time of just planning to actually releasing butterflies at Pinery, and then of course this year to seeing that some of them successfully overwintered. So that's really exciting. Um, it should be out in 2023 at some point. Um, we've also have a recovery team website um, that's mentioned there that you're welcome to visit. It has lots of information about the people that are on the recovery team and the projects that we're doing. And then of course, we've uh, worked on getting some swag and apparel uh, uh, together as well to try and just promote um, that and I guess uh, diversify my wardrobe a bit. So in terms of next steps, um, in 2023, we, can, we intend to continue our monitoring program, both at Pinery Park, where we um, introduce individuals, as well as the extant populations, including the one that we've taken butterflies from. So we'll continue to monitor populations. Um, as I mentioned, we're also going to have that full length documentary next year. We're also looking at starting additional reintroductions in Norfolk County. So uh, the plan was always to see how things went at Pinery. Um, and if the, they were successful, then we would look to Norfolk as the next location uh, for reintroductions. And then on top of all of that for model duskywing, I'm also working on a frosted elfin recovery feasibility assessment for the um, Frosted, or sorry, for the Frosted Elfin for Canadian Wildlife Service. And really the work that we've done on model duskywing, it's always you know, um, somewhat controversial in some circles to focus so much effort and attention on one species. Um, and although we've done that, 
I've always tried to do it in a way that um, takes an ecosystem-based approach. So everything that we're doing is is beneficial not only for model dusty wing, but for all the species that are, are dependent on oak savanna systems. So the habitat restoration, the monitoring, the invasive species management, all of that has a conservation ripple effect to a huge range of species at risk that occupy these habitats. They include birds, snakes, plants. Um, it's a large complement of Ontario species at risk that occur in these habitats. The other thing that we've done by, by doing all this work on model dusky wing is that we've kind of paved the way for other butterfly species at risk that also used to occupy those habitats. And I've always had a particular interest in butterflies um, because they're really good indicators of environmental change. The fact that we lost three of these species that specialize in these habitats completely from those ecosystems was a very big warning sign that something was really wrong in those systems. And on the flip side of that, if we could reintroduce them and sustain them, that's a really good indication that something right is going on and that the systems are healthy. Um, and there are a lot Lost the sound. Yeah. Um, do we have her cell phone, Ellen, to text her? Ellen, do we have her cell phone? I I don't think we do. I'm going to I'm going to email her though. Although okay. perhaps perhaps she's coming back now. Hang on a sec. Um, Just to let you know, we lost uh, Linda, but uh, we're gonna we're working on a technical problem. Sorry, Jessica. So be patient. Hopefully, we'll get her very soon. So we ask for your patience, please. We're working on it. Thank you. You know, it's it's possible that she's not even aware <laughs> that 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 the the connection's been lost, and she's not on it. We cannot have her on a chat, eh? Um, no. Because I thought we could send her, uh, but she's not there. Hold on. We may want to pause the um, the recording. Oh, there we go. Okay. The internet just dropped. I don't know what happened there. Well, we can hear you, Jessica, and uh, give a pause for everybody. So welcome back, and uh, here you go. We're giving you the mic now. Sorry, did you guys catch the end of the presentation? No, we didn't. Oh, no. Where did we leave off? I don't even... I didn't realize it. Uh, we lost you with the um, the fact that the assessment uh, is in progress, but also that focusing. Some people say that focusing on uh, such small thing as, as the butterfly. You were explaining why it's so important because they're really the red flag of that something is going gotcha. wrong with the ecosystem. So that's about that. Yeah. Where we that okay. We were, well, that yeah. was like the the kind of the finishing message that I had there. I'll just throw my screen back up here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we it was like that. We have this one, and you uh, you were on this um, right. slide. Okay, so that was. I guess we didn't. We got pretty good then. We just missed the end here. Um, so as I mentioned, I guess my my concluding remark about that is just that. Um, 
I would like the work that we're doing with the recovery team. And I think that we are achieving this goal. Um, it's achieving a conservation ripple effect in order um, for all of these organizations to work together to restore and um, and increase the amount of oak savanna habitat we have in Southern Ontario, which is beneficial to a huge range of species. Um, and then we'll continue this work on model duskyling, which was also going to pave the way for these other butterfly species at risk that we're working on. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the funders that have contributed to this work. Um, it, it has been no small task to complete all of this work and fund all of this work. Um, we couldn't have done it without all of these generous con contributions. And then I'd just like to say thank you and hopefully my internet stays on and I can answer questions. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted. Technology. Yeah, before everybody start the question, I have one from the chat that was going on when you were talking, and it's from Elizabeth, and she was asking if you can get genetic information without killing the butterfly. Oh, yes, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the sampling technique we use is non-lethal, and so essentially it involves taking a really small piece, like I think it's point. 0.25 amount of tissue from the butterfly wing. Um, so we just take a little tiny piece off with tweezers um, and that's enough for us to get the genetic information. We did need more genetic material in order to develop the markers for the butterflies, but for those we used um, the females that expired in captivity after they had laid all their eggs for our captive rearing program and we had the whole butterflies and they just died naturally and then we used those ones for the genetic markers. You're satisfied, Elizabeth, with the, the answer? Good. So anybody else will have some question for Jessica? Go ahead, please. Okay, I have two new messages. Let's see, people want me to ask. <laughs> and, uh, I guess with this, you can take it, you can easily tell the female and males apart. Mm. Um, yes, you can tell them apart. There are distinctive um, things about the butterflies that allow us to tell them apart. Um, I would say they're not, they're not as obvious as they telling uh, a male and a female monarch apart where the males have like the distinctive black scent patches on the back of their wings. Um, but there are ways that we can tell them apart, especially if we have them in hand. So often we will, if we can't see it with binoculars, we'll capture them and look at them. Their abdomens uh, will either have an, an evident ovipositor if they're a female or claspers if they're a male to hold on to the females. That's the most distinctive thing about them. Good. And uh, Serena here is asking, how could one get involved in the reintroduction and monitoring for these types of studies? Yeah, so we've, um, we put out calls for hiring people every spring. Um, so I would say the best way to stay up on those sorts of things is just keep an eye on the recovery team website or follow any one of the um, members on Twitter or Facebook. I usually try to advertise like on the Ontario Field Nats page. Um, you know, I send the, the call out widely. Um, and like I mentioned, we hired 18 people this year to work on this project. So we've done that by a combination of our NSERC funding, but also by applying for um, subsidy grants from the government. Okay. Uh, please, people, don't be shy to ask the question if you open your mic. But right now, I'm going to continue with the chat one. It seems like they want me to work. <laughs> uh, Nancy is asking, what is the feasibility for reintroductions to High Park? Um, yeah, that's a good question and one that um, we've actually talked about. My my partner and I um, actually have friends that are involved in Hyde Park Nature and we've talked to them about it. And I am not personally familiar enough with Hyde Park um, to say what the quality or extent of habitat is. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that, you know, I would say never say never. Good. And Jim here is asking, is there a benefit to planting New Jersey tea plants in the city? I would say absolutely. Um, 
in addition to New Jersey tea being like the host plant for this particular butterfly, it pollinators of all kinds, flies, mosquitoes, bees, wasps, they love New Jersey tea. I actually have this really cool video of a flowering, and it's a beautiful flower too. So it's really quite like ornamental for a garden, but I have a video of a fully flowering New Jersey tea and it actually was buzzing like very loud because there were so many pollinators covering it. It was really incredible. I'm just curious, where would you get these plants? Because you don't see it in a regular nursery, right? Where could you buy these plants? Yeah, I've um, seen them on a, um, in most native plant nurseries um, you could get them yeah. from. And I've also ordered them online from um, Ontario Native Plants and they've just okay. been delivered straight to my door. It's good, good, uh, good tips, thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to ask a question to Jessica? I guess um, I'm. I'm wondering about. Uh, I mean, Nancy asked about High Park and and reintroductions there, and of course in High Park um, we think of the Carner Blue. Are there any places other than High Park where uh, a butterfly like the Carner Blue could be reintroduced? Uh, I mean, maybe High Park is is too heavily impacted, but are there any other places that that butterfly could be reintroduced? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. Um, Cardinal Blue is a bit of a tricky one. One, because it requires a huge amount of habitat. So in most of what we know about Cardinal Blue is coming to the United States and the, the recovery efforts there. Um, and it's estimated that it needs about 150 hectares of habitat. Um, within that 150 hectares, it needs about seven to nine um, good sized patches of wild lupin. Uh, because it existed in the landscape in this metapopulation structure where they occupy certain areas and then areas get disturbed or burned, but there's areas for them to kind of move to and occupy. Um, the other thing about Carner Blue is that they, they have surprisingly large numbers of adult butterflies when they're flying. And the minimum number of butterflies in the second brood of, of flight time, they estimate as 3,000 butterflies in order to have a self-sustaining population. That's a lot of butterflies. Um, and I think the reason for that is that they overwinter as an egg. And um, that's not a good strategy. <laughs> so that's, you know, there, that's a limiting factor that biologically that species faces. Um, you know, eggs have a high rate of predation. They're very vulnerable. Um, and so they need, I think, so many butterflies and so many eggs in order to actually survive into the following year. Um, so there's a lot of things that are working against it. We currently do not have anywhere in Ontario that has enough habitat to, to consider reintroducing that species. Um, and there's also um, a lot of evidence coming into the states and their efforts that they're doing that uh, we don't know enough yet to be successfully reintroducing it. So they're pumping like, hundreds of thousands of dollars into it and not it's not working everywhere they're doing it so to me that's a it's not an ideal species to think about yet and because they're putting so much effort into it in the united states it's like well let's let them figure it out and when they have the right recipe maybe we can think about it and maybe we'll have enough uh, habitat by then but as i mentioned um our attention is turning somewhat now to frosted elephants which is a species that um, occurs in the same habitats, but it requires less overall habitat and it has a larger minimum population size. So it's a more realistic goal, I think. We have Margaret here that is asking, what about Ontario Place? There's one area that might suit a massive planting for butterflies. Once uh, she looked up and saw hundreds of monarchs flying along Lakeshore Boulevard. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of places where we can create habitat, um, but of course, there's often people who have different ideas about what should happen with that land. So um, right now, I would say that the largest uh, advances are being made by the Nature Conservancy of Canada down in Boat County. Um, they've been able to buy and restore huge areas of habitat, mainly in old tobacco farms, um, and, and reintroduce lupin on a significant scale down there like some fields with like a hundred thousand stems um so that's amazing considering you know maybe 10 years ago lupin was reduced to just a few isolated pockets around the province so in terms of uh, wanting to 
create a, a new habitat or re relocate it. Uh, what does it take? It takes like the people from, it's at different, I guess there's people at different level that you have to get involved and that's where it becomes more complicated. And is it like mostly the area, the county, the government, the city, like, is it all that that has to play a role into it or? Um, it depends. Um, you know, most of the work that's being done in terms of habitat creation is done by uh, parks, like so the provincial or federal government, as well as organizations like Nature Conservancy who have a mandate to uh, protect land and restore land. So, you know, they can't just buy any property and create any habitat. You know, it has a lot to do with like the local climate, the soils, the topography, all of these things, the seed bank. Um, so, you know, I think Nature Conservancy tries to put back the habitat that makes the most sense in a particular area. And it just so happens that in Norfolk County, in the, in the Norfolk Sand Plains there, um, it's very conducive to um, mm -hmm. Black Oak, Savannah, and Prairie because most of it has what occurred, there's a lot that occurred there and it's just succeeded to oak woodland. The largest habitats like this that we have now um, exist in Pinery Provincial Park, Walpole Island, Ojibwe Prairie. Um, and then outside of those kind of larger areas, um, we're talking like the majority of prairies and oak savannas in Ontario are like less than half a hectare. So, mm -hmm. so. Okay. And are you using fire at the pinery? And then is asking. Yep. Fire is used at the pinery. They have a prescribed burning program um, that they have been implementing for a number of years now, like since the late 80s. Um, the program has changed over the years, but it's 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 managed and done by the park. The problem with prescribed fire uh, or implementing burns anywhere is that um, you need specialized trained people to do it. You also have to hit um, a, a number of what they call prescriptions. So you need the wind, you need the humidity to be just right. You need your fuel to be just right. So there's a lot of things that go into a fire that make it difficult sometimes to pull off in a, in a narrow window every year. And on top of that, at Pinery, they have a lot of values, we call them. So, you know, there are people in the park and cottages around the park and campgrounds. So things that they have to consider on top of just the ecosystem um, to make a fire happen. But um, yes, they are burning and it, it is in large part the reason that the habitat is in such good shape today, I would say. Good, good. It's quite satisfying, I'm sure, for you to see it, the result of it, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to double check. Uh, okay. I'm reading just, Lenka, Lenka is a question here. I'm just going to go through you, through it. It's quite long. Lenka, you don't want to ask it? I guess not. Okay. So I can it, do it. I can do it. Yeah, go. Oh, it's up to you. Go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Um, basically, what I'm saying in my very long comment is that it's well known that Pinery Provincial Park is extremely busy. And um, being busy, it's perhaps good from some perspective, but extremely challenging from protection conservation perspective. Um, and somebody, actually Ellen, was kind of um, going around whether a, a Carnal Blue could be reintroduced to High Park. Basically, when I see the similarities is two uh, rare natural areas with very high biodiversity. High Park has extremely high biodiversity and is accordingly to TRCA um, um, biological report from two years ago, comparable or even higher to places out of town. Um, the problem is basically vitality of the place as ecosystem. The, the use is um, too intense, too out of control, inhibiting, for example, um, the ground nesting um, birds. 
Hyde Park has the land, docks, off leash designated area. I am sure Pinery Provincial Park also has many visitors from Toronto exhibiting the same pattern of behavior as we have in Hyde Park. So I see the similarities. How is Pinery dealing with impacts of visitation? Do they have um, any special management plan prioritizing mm -hmm. protection? mandate, which is to conserve ecological integrity. Are there any special rules that would yeah. go ahead? I think I, I said it all. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a good point that you make, Lenka. And um, it is one of these things that I'm sure uh, every kind of natural area struggles with is balancing the idea that we want people to be able to enjoy these places and see these places. Um, but also people in those places, they cause problems for the wildlife and plants often, either through trampling or noise or introduction uh, inadvertently of things like invasive species. Um, and as the population continues to grow, these are threats you know, to all natural areas. Um, and so in terms of pinery specifically, um, it's the, I think the highest visited parks, provincial park. You know, yes. Um, in Ontario, um, it does see a high number of visitors. And we often uh, comment, my partner and I, when we're sitting there in those campsites, like, because we we camp the whole, the whole summer when we have a research team there, um, that the majority of people that are there visiting, they're there to camp and they have no idea what's around them, you know, like when exactly. we're birding and everything, like, oh, these people have no clue. Um, the good thing about Pinery, I think that they are doing a very good job um, relative to the area that Pinery covers, um, the campgrounds are pretty small. Um, and, you know, there are huge areas of Pinery that have no people in them at all, no camping, no infrastructure or anything. Um, so those are kind of like the oasis areas. I think more concerning is the development that's happened outside the park, which kind of makes it this isolated island, you know. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, um, I also know that there is a desire from the people who manage Pinery in terms of the ecology to, you know, put limitations or even reduce the number of visitors per year. Um, but the, you know, you always are having to balance, you know, if there's no funding there from our government otherwise, and the only way these parks have to, to raise funds and sustain themselves is through, um, is through day pass and camping fees too. Um, so there's always there's always like these struggles between all these different competing needs, um, but I think and and surprisingly, um, Pinery has like one full time park ecology person, which is mind boggling to me, um, and because there just isn't funding there for more, and so there's like summer staff, but that's it. Okay, so at least they're putting some effort uh, as a park to which makes the difference maybe than other places. As the people who work at the parks, like the ecologists that work at the parks, they have, um, you know, a deep connection to those areas and um, are really trying to do the right thing. I would say mm -hmm. that um, I wish that our, our government would support them more in those efforts. Well, I think it's going to be the end of uh, our Q&A, and uh, I want to, um, unless there are one or two more questions, you have a few minutes to, to jump in, uh, and uh, if not, we will close with some announcement that uh, Ellen will bring to us. I want to thank you, Jessica, for sharing with us all your research, your involvement, and you with Endangered Wildlife in Canada, and uh, thank you for doing that kind of work for us. Mm, thank